What is up guys, Austin Rachel here, back again with another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover Raw and Nitro from 1997. And so this week we're looking at Raw number 239 and Nitro number 119. So before we get into it, I just want to say that I am sick and I have a sore throat and stuff, so I'm not going to sound probably very good throughout this and I have cough drops and everything, so it's just going to sound a little different. But so but for both of these shows, they were both pretty big episodes for both shows. Raw wasn't like a major episode, but it still had some good stuff and that went on in it. And of course, Nitro is leading up to Starcade, so we'll deal with all that. Um, so this Raw, as I mentioned last week, because they had a little advertisement for it, that this is their Christmas special, because this is obviously the Raw right before Christmas. Obviously, this is December 22nd, 1997. And um, so in the ratings, Raw... The thing I can find, I don't know if I trust it very well, because I don't like Nitro's rating, but Raw got a 3.1, which is up a little, but not, at least I think it is, I can't remember what last week's was, but it seems about pretty good for Raw and stuff, and this Raw took place in Lowell, Massachusetts, so this is kind of a, it's a different looking building, it's not their normal big size building, and I'm almost sure that they did a pre-recorded, I mean, pretty much all their shows are pre-recorded, but like they did it and then commentary talked over it and stuff. It was almost like a house show. But in the same place I know was where uh, Shawn Michaels I think like did the whole I lost my smile speech and stuff. So it's kind of an interesting looking building that once you see it you, like if you've watched old Rawls and stuff you'll recognize it. But the show starts off with a video package of the LOD and or on the LOD and the events that took place last week. Where the uh, DX and the New Age Outlaws end up beating up on Legion of Doom. And suppose like sent them packing or retiring or whatever. I don't know exactly sure. But so that video plays even though it doesn't have a huge part in this show. So I don't know exactly why they played that. But we then go into the actual show. And it kicks off with DX coming out to the ring. And they're wearing um, at least Triple H and Shawn Michaels are wearing right white robes. And so they come into the ring and uh, they mention that DX has a present for all the good boys and girls of the crowd. But before they get to that they want to talk about some stuff. And the first thing is that they're having an issue with the New Age Outlaws because the Outlaws are taking credit for ending LOD's career when it was DX that ended the career. And so the Outlaws better watch it around them. And then Triple H uh, gets on the mic and mentions that he won the Rock Paper Scissors match from last week. And so that he's now going to be the one to send Owen Hart packing. And then Sean is back on the mic and he brings up the whole stuff with Undertaker and that he mentions that he has beat the Undertaker the last two times they've had matches and that when they meet at the Royal Rumble for the casket match, he'll beat him for the third time. And so then they decide to give the crowd their presence. And so their presence is them and it's they end up taking off their robe and it's them with nothing on but um, a pair of boxers or whatever and they have like Christmas design. I think they look like presents or something. And then they say, now time for your real present so they turn around and then uh, pull down their underwear and their uh, censored logo like a DX censored logo immediately pops up on the screen covering them but you can see it a little bit um, later on after this in the next part they they're actually wearing like thongs or something like Santa Claus thongs or something like the uh, front part has a Santa Claus head on it and so they blurred out because of the bare butts or whatever and stuff and so they just covered that. But like I said, you could see it later on because they still have like the censored thing on Shawn Michaels, but not on Triple H as they're putting their robes back on. But in response to that, Sergeant Slaughter ends up coming out. So that's when they start putting their robes on and you can see Triple H is wearing a thong. And so he t tells them that Shawn Michael will have to defend his European title tonight because he hasn't um, defended it in like two months or, or he said uh, 60 days. So yeah, that's about two months. So we'll have to defend it tonight or be stripped of it. And Shawn was like, you know what? I'm a fighting champion. I'll defend it tonight. And Slaughter's like, well, that's good because you're going to be defending it against Triple H tonight. And of course, they start freaking out like... You can't do this to us and everything. And so that's the match that we have later on tonight. But Triple H is on the mic real quick. And he brings up that he'll be winning tonight. And then Shawn Michaels takes his exception by that. And saying that he's won two titles. And not by being a loser. And then he does the whole like the, uh, L like whatever shape with his hand. And puts it on his forehead towards Triple H and stuff. So he's calling him a loser. So it's kind of building tension between those two. We then go into our first match of the night, which is the Headbangers taking on the Godwins. Well, it's actually Thrasher from the Headbangers and Henry Godwin. At one point in the match, Thrasher ends up hitting a crossbody off the top rope and starts to go for a pin. But Phineas comes in and breaks up the pin. 
And so because of that, Fra Thrasher wins by disqualification. And then uh, the Godwins come in and attack the Headbangers. And they pull out leather straps and start attacking the Headbangers with that. And eventually officials come in and break them up and ending that segment. Then next up we get a replay of the um, feud of Dude Love against the Outlaws. So the past couple weeks where Dude Love has taken on each of the Outlaws. And then them knocking him off the stage last week down to the... Or through the table to the ground and stuff. And then that goes to Mankind sitting in the bowels of the arena. He's just in like a dark place, you know, with the camera on him. And he's cut a promo and he tells, um, just, and he's in his Mankind outfit. And he talks about he just wants to celebrate Christmas like everybody else. And that at Christmas it feels better to give than to receive. And so he's going to give the Outlaws a beating tonight. And then at the very end he mentions that this is the fight before Christmas instead of night before Christmas. And of course we know Mick Foley loves Christmas and plays Santa Claus and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of fitting that he does that and especially what he does later. Then we got a video replay from last week which of uh, stuff we didn't see. So it was after Raw went off the air. Stone Cold, or there was a Santa Claus in the ring, and he was talking about, you know, about people being good and stuff, and he eventually calls out Sable, that he's got a special present for her, and so he's waiting for her to come out, and it, like, plays the music and stuff, but she never comes out, so instead they bring a kid in from the crowd, and uh, Santa asks what he wants, and the kid says, you're not the real Santa. And so the Santa gets mad at that and kicks the kid out of the ring. And then after that happens, Stone Cold comes out to confront the Santa Claus. And Stone so Cold asks the Santa Claus, if you're the real Santa and can prove it to me, what did I ask for when I was six years old? And Santa says, I remember you wanted a Barbie doll and tiddlywinks. Which I don't know what those are. And so that obviously is not correct or whatever. And so Stone Cold asks the crowd if um, he is Santa and the crowd goes hell no and so stone cold gets up and stuns the santa claus and then starts attacking himself so i assume that was after all last week so we had stone cold throwing the title in the river so either he drove back to the arena or as i know it happened they pre-filmed that and then just played it last night or that night and stone cold was in the arena the whole time after he had come out and told the rock to watch the monitor and stuff then next up we cut to the back locker rooms and it's uh, showing the DX locker room door and you can hear yelling inside and the door opens and Shawn Michaels is yelling at Triple H and you know saying stuff about him you know again being like a loser and that Shawn doesn't need to deal with this so him and China end up leaving the locker room and then from there we go into a match of The Rock taking on The Undertaker. And so The Rock ends up attacking Undertaker from behind as Undertaker is distracted by D'Lo Brown on the outside. And so that The Rock ends up getting you know, an upper hand there from the beginning. But Undertaker is able to come back and he does a, um, the walking of the ropes. I don't know what it's called. I know they call it the old school now, but I don't know what they call it back then. And Paul Barron's up walking out the entrance at that same time. And like I assume, obviously, they knew it was happening because Undertaker me like looks over and is kind of distracted by him. And so, again, that takes Undertaker's attention. And Kama gets up on the ring and hits Undertaker with a low blow, knocking him off the top rope. And while this is going on, Fruk is distracting the referee. And Kama and D'Lo come up and start attacking the Undertaker on the outside. And then back in the ring, The Rock ends up low blowing The Undertaker when the ref is distracted. So they're just kind of distracting the ref a lot with all the nation members out there. And they're all attacking Undertaker at once. But in the end, Undertaker is able to get hit the choke slam and then a tombstone on The Rock. And he starts to go for the pin. But as he's doing that, the lights end up going out. And Kane comes out to the ring. And so Kane and Paul Bear in the ring and the nation is left at this point. And Paul Bear starts kind of promo on Undertaker, and he brings up the Undertaker's dead pa parents and, you know, spending Christmas w without his parents and stuff. And Undertaker starts to go for Paul Bear, but Kane starts attacking Undertaker, and he hits him a couple times, and um, he goes to hit him, and Undertaker ends up grabbing a hold of him, and Kane's just standing there, and Undertaker's, you know, there wide open to be able to hit or attack Kane back. But he doesn't attack him, and then Kane continues to beat him up. And then we eventually, the segment ends or whatever, so we don't know exactly what happened at the end. And then we move on to hour number two, and Shawn Michaels versus Triple H match is going to be happening now. And Shawn Michaels comes out to ring, and then Triple H starts to come out. And as he's coming out, Owen Hart comes running out through the entrance and attacks Triple H from behind. And so Sergeant Slaughter ends up postponing the match till later on tonight because of Triple H being attacked and everything. 
Then we go to the back where we get one of the first segments of the night of Road Dog and Billy Gunn in the bowels of the arena searching for mankind. And so they're, they're searching around like dark areas and stuff like that. And they end up seeing a guy and they go up and start attacking him because they thought it was mankind, but it's just some random guy. And so they realize that it's not him and so they just run away. And so that's, like I said, our first segment of that tonight. Then next up, we have a match of Mark Merrow taking on Scott Taylor. And so as Mark Merrow comes out to the ring, he ends up bringing out his, I forget what he calls her, but his, I want to say his pet or something, but I'm not sure. But he brings out Sable, and as she walks out, she's in like a reindeer costume. And uh, it's a funny looking costume, but he's having her do stuff in the ring as he usually does, like taking off his jacket and stuff like that. And so she goes out and the match starts and pretty much as soon as the match starts, she ends up taking off the mask or the reindeer head. And I, I thought that was kind of important because I thought the whole time, oh, that's not really Sable. But it, she took off the mask or helmet or whatever the reindeer head was <laughs> and you that proved that it was Sable. And then uh, the crowd starts chaining at her to take it off and stuff. And then in the match, because like I said, nothing major happens in it. But Mark Merrow ends up getting the win with the TKO. And then he starts setting up Scott Taylor to do a second TKO on him. Until Tom Brandy comes running out to save Taylor. And so Brandy just starts beating up Mark Merrow. And Sable gets in the ring and starts taking off the reindeer costume. And she's wearing what I guess you'd call like a sexy Santa costume or dress. Or like a Mrs. Claus dress or something like that. It looks like, you know, Santa's red coat and everything. But it's in like a dress form and everything. And she gets on the mic and she just wishes everyone a Merry Christmas. So it's a nice Christmas thing going on. On there and still getting sable exposure the next up we have a match of eight ball from the disciples of apocalypse taking on kurgan from the truth commission of course kurgan comes out with the jackal so as they're walking out the jackal goes over to some girl in the crowd he's like cutting a promo the whole time and stuff and he ends up putting a jewel on the girl's head and so it's, i guess like kind of like brainwashing her or whatever because he's now starting to to be like a cult leader and so the whole time the match is going on he's just cutting a promo on the microphone and so as usual kurgan just dominates the whole match but the jackal at one point grabs a ball's leg and so a ball turns around and grabs him and is dealing with him and kurgan comes up from behind and attacks him and then hits him with a side slam for the win and so kurgan and jackal are like in the ring kind of celebrating the win and abel comes up and attacks him from behind and the other truth commission guys come running out to like help Kurgan and Jackal and then Skull runs out and attacks all of them and he's carrying a two by four and he just kind of clears out the ring with that. Then next up we have another outlaws searching for mankind and so this time they're searching around with uh, flashlights and they have hard hats on they have lights on them and they're just like searching around in dark areas and one of them bumps into some knocks it over and it scares both of them and stuff and so it's just funny of like a comedy thing of them scaring each other and stuff. Then we go to a match of D'Lo Brown taking on Ken Shamrock. And so very early in the match, Ken Shamrock starts attacking D'Lo's legs, like kicking him and stuff like that. And Shamrock's eventually able to get the ankle lock on for the win. And soon after that, The Rock ends up coming out and he starts cutting a promo. And so we offer Shamrock to have a match with him at the Royal Rumble for the IC title. And I thought it was just kind of funny because during the match, JR kept talking about Ken Shamrock. That JR would predict that Shamrock's going to have or hold the IC or the heavyweight title by the early part of next year. And so, you know, if he won the Royal Rumble, Rumble, that would be a good way to get that title early next year. But so um, having the match with The Rock, I would think kind of takes him out of it. But you never know. Back then, they would have multiple matches, and then those guys would still be in the Royal Rumble. Then next up, we have JR at commentary, whatever, even though there's no commentary, it's a pre recorded or whatever. And uh, he's talking to Shawn Michaels, who's like supposed to be sitting back in the locker room and everything. And Shawn Michaels is, just mentions that Triple H is the ugliest part of DX and that tonight Shawn will teach him a lesson and stuff. So again, just building up for their match later. And then we go back to the New Age Outlaws and the Bows once again. And this time they end up coming across Mankind. And so they're in like a dark closet type looking place with no lights on stuff. And that's where he was hiding. And so they all just start fighting and Mankind just beating up both of them. But as he's doing stuff, he's just singing Christmas carols. I forget. It's like the chestnuts roasting on open fire. Jack Frost and Infinite at your nose, that song and stuff. And so Mankind just singing that, like saying lines as he's beating them up and stuff. And I just thought it was funny. But eventually the Outlaws are able to like kind of get the upper hand and they kind of er, and they push mankind into a walk-in freezer and then shut the door on him and stuff and so i guess that's how they like beat him or whatever 
Then we go back out to the ring and we have Goldust coming out with Luna and they just come out to the ring. And both of them are wearing super crazy Christmas outfits. Like, I know Goldust is wearing like his, no, not normal outfit, but his outfit. He's been wearing the like neon green outfit. And he has like Christmas decorations on him, like uh, the tinsel garland and stuff. And he has a tree topper on his head and stuff. And he's just being all weird. And so he comes out to the ring and he starts uh, reading the Twas the Night Before Christmas thing. And he's doing with the list, but like he's gay. And as Goldust is reading the Night Before Christmas poem stuff, a Santa Claus comes walking out and so he's just walking around ringside and he's handing out candy and stuff from a bag and so just being a santa claus stuff and of course that makes gold dust man he's like can you leave and he's just yelling at him to leave and all sorts of stuff and so gold dust can he dream and the santa claus ends up getting in the ring behind gold dust and ends up attacking him with his bag of goodies and he ends up knocking him out of the ring and stuff. And then he takes off the sand outfit and it's vader underneath and then once gold dust and luna realize that it's vader they both go running out of the arena into the back ending off that segment we then move into our main event for the night which is triple h and Shawn michaels so that whole match and so um they both end up coming out and they're taking a while to like start the match so they're both just kind of like starting to go for each other and then they'll back off and just kind of move around the ring they go over and talk each of them talk to china individually and stuff and then they eventually come together and they lock up and Shawn michaels immediately just falls down to the ground on his back and then Triple H starts running the rope multiple times. I have no clue why, but he just runs it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, many different times. And then he stops and does a horrible splash. Like he starts like falling and jumping. It's just, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but it just wasn't a good splash. But he pretty much does the ultimate warrior finisher thing. And he did a splash on Shawn Michaels and Triple H pins him and ends up winning. And so Triple H is the new European champion and stuff. And so Shawn Michaels gets a hold of the microphone and he starts talking and he's crying and stuff. Talking about how no match has ever been this hard. And that Triple H was just a better opponent than he was and stuff. And then uh, of course this is all a whole joke and they're playing off whatever. So Triple H ends up getting the mic and he's saying that um, this is the greatest day of his life. And he's kind of like teared up and stuff. And then I think they end up hugging each other saying I love you or whatever and stuff. And at this time, Sergeant Slaughter had come out in the entrance, and he's just standing at the entrance watching him and stuff. And he ends up saying it where the mic or where the cameras pick it up, but obviously he's not saying it into a microphone or anything, so Triple H and Sean can't hear it. But he ends up saying that Triple H will defend the title next week against Owen Hart on next week's Raw. So that was a pretty good episode of Raw. Again, it was all like Christmassy and stuff. I like how they incorporated a lot of Christmas stuff. I enjoy that that they do. They don't just like ignore the whole day or put uh like one single little holiday match or something they had it throughout the show and stuff and they had like snow falling the fake snow falling in the arena the whole time and stuff and it was just pretty cool and i really enjoyed it so that was a pretty good episode of raw and now we have triple h as the european champion and uh just a lot of fun stuff going on there so we will now move on to nitro and again this is nitro number 119 and this took place, uh, obviously, as I said earlier, December 22nd, 1997. And it took place in Macon, Georgia. And uh, this is the go-home episode of Starcade, and it's another three-hour episode. So that was fun to get through. And so by the ratings, I found this Nitro ended up drawing a 3.5 rating, which is really low. Like, they've been in the fours and stuff. And so I don't under that's why I don't tr know if I trust that rating or not. Yeah, especially with the go home to their biggest pay per view of all time, of all of Nitro or WCW, I don't can't really see how that's their rating or whatever. But you never know. But this is Nitro One Nineteen. If I didn't say that already, and so the show kicks off with um, a replay of the ending of last week of the Flair and Kurt Henning match and how DDP came out to save and Nitro or all the NWO and all that sort of stuff, and so that just shows the replay of that. And we go into the actual show, and it's got the Nitro girls dancing in the ring, and they're wearing Santa hats, and there's like Christmas music, techno y disc, or dancey Christmas music. I don't know how to describe it. A beat Christmas music playing that they're dancing to and stuff. So, again, they're trying to add some Christmas flair to the show. And then we get a um, NWO black and white commercial of an Eric Bischoff like promo type thing, and he's always all talking about Larry Zabisco and everything. And he's talking about that Larry will lose because he underestimates Eric's power and that tonight Eric has a gift for him, even though I don't know uh, exactly what it is or not. 
But then we come back and we get our first match of the night, which is Fit Finley taking on Eddie Guerrero. And once again, Fit Finley is like one of my favorite people to watch now. And very early on in the match, Eddie Guerrero starts trying to attack and work over Finley's legs. But Finley ends up dominating most of the match, but Eddie ends up taking a few cheap shots whenever he can and stuff. But at one point, Eddie Guerrero ends up going up to the top rope, but Finley's able to get up and he superplexes Eddie off the top rope. And then Eddie ends up leaving the ring and saying, you know, I don't need this and stuff. And he ends up just walking towards the back. And so he ends up getting count out, giving another win for Fit Finley. Then next up, we have a pre-made video thing of the Giant, like, talking about his match with Kevin Nash and about him being the true Giant and all sorts of stuff like that. So just continuing on with what they've been doing. Then next, we have a match of Ming with coming out with Jimmy Hart taking on Steve McMichael. And I think this was the match we were supposed to have last week, if I remember right. I know it was Steve and one of the Faces of Fear by Cameron Fizming or not. But we get this match this week and no Goldberg interference. So in the match at one point, Ming ends up hitting the pile driver on Mongo, Steve, Mon or I'll just call him Mongo for short. And, but Mongo ends up kicking out of it. And then Ming also hits a splash off the top rope. But instead of, he starts the, or he goes for the pin. But as the refer hits uh, the two, Ming pulls him up to continue, you know, beating on Mongo and stuff. Then at one point, Jimmy Hart tries to hit Mongo with a chair, but Mongo ends up ducking and Jimmy ends up hitting the ring post instead. And then back in the ring, Mongo ends up hitting Ming with a wooden chair and the, like, Ming's head breaks through it so it's like stuck on Ming's head or whatever, or around his neck. And then Mongo picks up the seal chair that Jimmy Hart tried to hit him with and then hits Ming with that. And then he picks up Ming and hits a tombstone pile driver on him to get the win. Then next up we have the Nitro Girls and dancing and they do a little Nitro Party ad and stuff. And the commentary mentions that the Nitro Party ad winner or Nitro Party winner will be announced tonight. Then we have Mean Jane bringing out DDP for an interview. And DDP ends up, uh, as he comes out, he has like a bag, kind of like a Santa bag or whatever too. And he starts throwing out shirts to the crowd. So like, I, th I assume they're DDP shirts and stuff like that. And then DDP mentions that he's taking Flair's spot at Starcade against Kurt Henning. Since uh, Flair got injured and stuff from last week. And then he mentions that he's going to rip Kurt Henning apart like a present and then make him feel the bang. And so that's uh, kind of interesting that DDP's taking Flair's spots because... Flair keeps like getting taken out of a lot of stuff or whatever with injuries or whatever or you know fake injuries and stuff. Then next up we have a little Mike Tanay video like it's him voicing over stuff and it's a tale of the tape on the Giant versus Kevin Nash and so again they're doing more like promo for their match even though I don't know why. And then that goes into our match of Psychosis and or Psychosis Silver King and La Parka taking on Juventud, Hector Garza and Rey Mysterio Jr. So this was a pretty good match overall. It was fast paced and had a lot of good high flying and stuff. Um, there were a couple messy moves going on as a, to me a lot of luchadors do, but you you know just kind of take that with it. But then at one point, they all of them start doing a sequence of moves off the top rope. So obviously there'll be like a guy on the ground. And one guy will go up and do a move. And the guy that's on the ground ends up rolling out of the way. And so the guy off the jumping off the top rope, you know, misses. And so he's laying in the ring. And then someone else jumps off try, or tries to jump off of that guy. That guy rolls. And so they just keep switching out places of doing moves off the top rope and, and missing and stuff. Um, then at one point, Hector Garza ends up hitting the corkscrew planche off the top rope onto the group of guys on the floor. And while that's going on, Rey Mysterio hits the Hurricane Rana on Silver King to get the win for his team. Then next up, we have the Nitro Party video announcing the winner. And it's some like people from a frat house at University of Tennessee Chattanooga, I believe is what it's, the place is called. But it's just another frat house. Then next up, we have Chris Benoit taking on Hammer, or Van Hammer, from Raven's Flock. So as Benoit comes out, he gets on mic and he challenges all the flock to come in to make it more of a fair match with all of them taking on him. And as the match starts, Benoit starts attacking uh, Hammer's legs and, you know, trying, because since he's a big guy, trying to, like, take him down the size or whatever. And it's brought up by commentary that Raven is still not there. But Benoit will be having a match with him at Starcade. So again, I don't know why Raven's not been on for, like, a whole month now. If not more. And so I don't know what's going on there. But at one time Chris Benoit and Hammer were fighting on the outside. And the flock jumps the railing. And starts attacking Ben Or a couple of them start attacking Benoit on the outside. 
And so at this point, I assume the refs like throwing at the match and there's DQ or whatever. But they're all fighting with Benoit on the outside, and Saturn or Perry Saturn ends up coming off the top rope onto Benoit on the outside, and then picks him up and throws him into the ring, and it puts the rings of Saturn on him, ending off the match. And then we go into, I don't know if this is the start of Hour 2 or it's somewhere around here, but the NWOB team ends up coming out and they start taking over commentary. And so they just like kick out all the commentary guys. And Buff Bagel goes over to a cameraman and takes the camera from him and is like, he's running the camera now. And he's like, uh, you know, showing the guy or whatever. And he keeps asking him if he's a part of the NWO. And the guys, you know, like dance around or whatever. And he's like, yeah, I am. And so Puff throws him an NWO shirt and says, here, put this on. And so then he hits the camera back. And so they start going around to all like the sorts of workers and stuff, you know, for WCW. And asking him if they're NWO and put, uh, Guinea giving them shirts and stuff and making them put it on. And so they start, uh, some of these worker guys, whatever, start changing out the signs on, like, commentary and all sorts of stuff from WCW Nitro to NWO Nitro signs. So, again, this is supposed to be NWO taking over Nitro. What they are predicting will happen at Starcade if Eric Bischoff wins. And then we go to the back where Conan's at the trucks outside and he's um, harassing the guys inside the video truck. And he ends up throwing one of the guys out because he doesn't answer in time or whatever. But he ends up, you know, passing out NWO shirts and then they hang a big like banner sign on the truck saying NWO Nitro. And then inside they have the big giant uh, diamond plating WCW signs on each side of the entrance ramp. They end up, they have like saws and stuff and they're cutting them down. And they end up putting a, a big NWO sign that's dropped down from the ceiling. And it's like lands in the middle of the stage and that's where they put it. But it's weird. But it goes to the ring and Buff Bag goes in the ring and he's talking to the ring announcer. I think his name's Dave Pinzer, but I can't remember if that's right or not. And he asks him and Dave's kind of like... It, you know, like not giving an answer, and so Buff ends up attacking him and throwing him out of the ring and stuff. Then takes the spray paint, sprays a big NWO in the middle of the ring, and then it looks up and there's uh, NWO Nitro banners hanging from this and stuff. So they're just completely transitioning over to the NWO Nitro right now and stuff. And so then they have a whole uh, thing of fireworks going off and stuff. So it's officially for sure an hour or two by now. But Eric Bischoff ends up coming out to the ring on a motorcycle and he brings out all of the NWO to the ring. And he says, uh, you know, the NWO has some gifts to give you to Hulk Hogan and, you know, just kissing up to Hulk Hogan and stuff. And the first thing he gives him is that this this episode of NWO Nitro is dedicated to Hulk Hogan. And then he's like, and then the next gift, and he brings out a motorcycle just like the one he ran out or rode out, and it's got NWO and stuff on it. And he gifts that to Hulk Hogan. He also gives him a stretch limo that, I don't know if it's an actual limo, it was a really long vehicle, but it had no top. So it was like, you know, from the front windshield all the way to the back, there was no top on the car or windows or anything. There were just doors and it was all open. But there was a, there's a hot tub in it, and it came with NWO girls. Nitro girls or whatever instead of WCW ones. Just two girls that were like sitting with their feet in the hot tub or whatever. And there's like some butler with champagne or whatever and stuff standing in the car or whatever. So they do all that and then we go into our first match of NWO Nitro. And the whole time this or as this goes on on commentary is Bischoff, Kevin Nash, and Rick Rude. Which ends up switching some people out but Rick Rude stays on commentary the whole time. But the first match is Rick Steiner coming out with Ted DiBiase taking out Scott Norton. And so they show this as a replay from the match last week that uh, the Steiners had with Norton and Bagwell, I believe, or Conan. I f yeah, Conan. And Scott Norton, like, dropped Rick Steiner on his head or something trying to do a power slam. And so this is like a kind of like a rematch of last week because of that. But with that there, this is a really boring match. Um, but at one point, Rick Steiner ends up going to, up to the top and Conan comes running out and hits the ropes, knocking Rick Steiner off. And then Norton and Conan end up beating up on Rick Steiner and the ref calls for DQ. And eventually, Scott Steiner comes running out to help his brother and then is followed by more NWO members to beat him up. But Ray Trailer ends up coming out and the NWO members end up leaving the ring at that point. Then we go to the um, showing commentary, so it's just, you know, those guys sitting at commentary, and they're just talking about uh, crap about the Giant and his match with Kevin Nash and stuff, so again, continuing to, like, do promotion for that match, uh, even though I don't know why. 
Then next up, we get the match of Disco Inferno taking on Kurt Henning. And then the match, Kurt Henning just dominates the whole match. And this match is way too long, which I've noticed with a lot of the matches that go on from now, they're just all way too long. Like, for the stuff that happens in it, it's just way too long. And so I guess that's why they went to three hours or whatever, just to fill out the time. But in the end, Kurt Henning ends up getting the win with the Fisherman Suplex. Then next up, we're back at commentary, and Bobby Heenan ends up walking out, and he comes out to commentary and saying that he just wants to talk business with Eric Bischoff, and so Heenan starts, like, just begging him to join and be a part of the NWO, and he's saying, you know, I can see the way things are going, and I just want to be a part of the winning team, and uh, so he's pretty much just asked kissing uh, all of the all of Bischoff, Rude, and Kevin Ash just saying all nice things about le- trying to let them, trying to get them to let him join with the NWO. And then we go to our next match and they do end up letting uh, Bobby Heenan on commentary. So he takes the place, I think, of Kevin Nash because Kevin's like, like, here he can have my spot. I got stuff to do in the back or something like that. And so Kevin Nash leaves and Heenan ends up taking his place at commentary. And then we get into our next match, which is Harlem Heat taking on members of the flock of Lodi and Scotty Riggs. And as this match is going on... Uh, Eric Bischoff ends up ask or calling for Mike Tenay to come out and to take his spot on commentary in Bischoff's place. So in the match, Harlem Heat just dominates the whole match, and eventually at one point, Scotty Riggs just ends up leaving ringside. So he just climbs, walks down the steps, and goes back out to his spot out in the crowd. And so Lodi's just left in there alone. But at one point, Stevie Ray ends up holding up Lodi, like just holding him up, like you know, they're whatever chest to chest, but Lodi's up higher because. Steve Ray's holding him and Booker T ends up hitting us the Harlem sidekick you know up and over Stevie's head or whatever and hitting Lodi in the face and that allows Harlem Heat to get the win and next up we have a match of Chris Jericho taking on Buff Bagwell and again this was a really long match for nothing interesting to happen at all but at one point Chris Jericho ends up hitting a double underhook backbreaker so he has him in the double underhook and Dio starts to like lift him up for the powerbomb version but then he drops him down on his knee into the backbreaker and he starts the pin buff but buff kicks out and after that happens the crowd just starts chanting bullshit and stuff. I mean I don't think it was that amazing to be like finisher I mean it was cool and stuff but I assume they think that they should have been the end of the match or something and Jericho should have won. But Buff ended up kicking out, and he eventually ends up hitting the blockbuster off the top rope to get the win, so Buff wins there. Then next up, we have all of NWO coming out to the ring once again, and Bischoff is here to give Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan more gifts. And one thing he gives him is a replica of the, world, or of the WCW World Heavyweight title in a ring form, so he can wear it around his finger or whatever. And he says, you know, it's ex- exact replica and everything. And then he gives him a picture and it like drops down from the ceiling or whatever. And it's a picture of Hogan on the front cover of Sports Illustrated from when he was in WWF. And then he gives him another picture that drops from the ceiling and it's of him choking Rocky from Rocky 3. It's like he's got a his hand around Sylvester Sloan's neck and is holding him up in the air. And again, those were just like hanging above the ring and stuff. So I don't know how they're giving those to Hogan, but whatever. Then next up we have a match of Macho Man coming out with Elizabeth and he's taking on Lex Luger. And so as Savage comes out he walks over to commentary where the microphones can pick him up or whatever. And he says that he's dedicating this match to Hulk Hogan. And then you know, they go into the match and Lex Luger comes out and everything. And at one point in the match they end up fighting to the outside again. Another Macho Man match where they fight on the outside. And they go into the crowd a little bit just like in the front row and then they come back over. Lex Luger... Uh, is in control now and he starts to hit the elbow on Macho Man and he goes to hit like the bionic elbow or whatever they call it on Macho but Macho ducks and he ends up hitting the referee instead and at this point Macho Man rolls out of the ring and he starts to hide behind Elizabeth as Luger comes for him and at this point Buff Bagel and Kevin Nash run out and they attack Luger from behind and in the ring Kevin Nash hits the powerbomb on Lex Luger and then Macho Man goes up top and hits the elbow drop off onto him and then he starts to cover him for the pin and Miss Elizabeth wakes the ref up or gets the ref woken up or whatever and he counts the pin and so Macho Man wins over Luger there. And so in this whole NWO Nitro so far all of the NWO guys have won as you'd expect but yeah they didn't let WCW guys win at all. And then we have our last segment of the night which is Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan coming out to the ring once again. And Hogan's just cutting a final promo on Sting before Starcade. And as he's doing this, a present comes into the ring, or a guy with a present comes into the ring, and he gives it off to Hogan. And Eric Bischoff's like, 
uh, Hogan's like, oh, Eric, you don't have to give me all these gifts. And Eric's like, that's not for me. He's like, I don't know who that's from. And, of course, they're playing off, like, who's this from or whatever. Well, then the limo, which had backed out a little, like, one of, during one of the matches or in between parts or something, it ended up backing out of the arena. And the, now it's driving back out. And, of course, when it comes to the curtain, sitting at the very back of it is Bret Hart sitting with the NWO Nitro girls or whatever. And Hogan, they're like, oh, it's a present from Bret and everything. And so Bret gets out and he's walking up and he stops, like, halfway in the entrance. And Hogan opens the present and it's his head inside. So it's like a dummy or a, like a fake plastic version of his head or whatever. It looks pretty good too. It looks a lot like Hulk Hogan and everything. But, but he's holding up and freaking out about it. And then he looks up and Sting is standing above the entrance ramp. So like up on the scaffolding type stuff they have around the entrance ramp. Standing up there again. And he's attaching himself to a zip line. And so he gets attached whatever and starts the zip line off of that. And he's reaching the ring. The ring so he's like you know landing in the ring as the show fades to black so we never get to see exactly what happens there but it's leaving the build up there for Starcade, which i don't think that was a very good build up like i think a lot of the matches were boring like they did obviously a lot of promotion for Starcade, but like the ending wasn't very climatic like if have got in the ring and faced off with hogan or beat him up or there's some sort of action not just him coming to the ring and it fades away um, I thought it'd be a lot more interesting, but we have, you know, all the matches set up and everything, and like I said, heading into the, their biggest pay-per-view ever. So like I said, I do hope to watch that before the next Nitro and stuff, like with Christmas coming up and having time off or whatever. I plan on taking some time and watching that Starcade since I've never seen it before, but of course I've heard a lot about it, know what happens in the main event and stuff, and that it's pretty shitty, but I still want to watch it just to see what happens there. But again, that Nitro, until they hit the NWO Nitro, it wasn't bad. But once they hit that, it was just like so boring. And like I said, all the matches lasted too long for what happened in them. And it was just painful to get through in that three. Or even though it's like two and a half or two, I forget, 220 maybe is what it's, you know, down because of all the commercials cut out and everything. But it took forever. Like it took me almost like a whole day to watch it. Of course, with breaks in between and stuff, but it just seemed like it never ended. So I definitely, definitely give the hand to Raw this week. That Raw was much better and a lot more entertaining. But that's going to be it for the Monday Night Rewind this week, where we went back to December 22nd, 1997, and covered Raw and Nitro there. And like I said, they had very, like, just 0.4 difference in rating, which, like I said, was a surprise for Starcade, but maybe people were watching the stuff that was going on and, like, this is boring, so we're not watching it or something. Not sure. But I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget you can listen to the podcast through iTunes under Monday Night Rewind, on SoundCloud through Monday Night Rewind, or through Awesome Nerd Show on YouTube, and you can find the episodes there every single weekend on all those platforms. And I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in any of the comments if you did, and don't forget to subscribe to where you can. And thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.